Good evening. This is Crime Classics. I am Thomas Highland with another true story of crime. Listen. The sound of brace and bit boring into wood. Good wood, mahogany, a hard wood. And since this is 1821 and the tools weren't as finely tempered as they are today, a resisting wood. One needed to really lean into it, give it muscle. Here's something. Water coming in at last. But how slowly. Just boring holes in the bottom of a ship. That's no way to scuttle it. Here's an axe. Mm. Ah. Oh, oh. Ah. <laughs> As I said, mahogany is a good hard wood. Fine for ship's keels. Doesn't hold up under an axe, though. Here comes the Atlantic Ocean. Tonight, my report to you on the good ship Jane, why she became flotsam. Crime Classics, a series of true crime stories taken from the records and newspapers of every land from every time. Your host each week, Mr. Thomas Highland, connoisseur of crime, student of violence, and teller of murders. Now, once again, Mr. Thomas Highland. Let's talk about schooners for a moment. The first one ever built was in Gloucester, Massachusetts, in 1713, by Captain Andrew, Andy, Robbie, Robinson. The schooner is a fore and aft rigged vessel and was much used in fishing in its earliest days. However, it was soon used as an ocean trader, taken as it was into the hearts of ship owners, since it used a smaller crew. The vessel that concerns us here is Jane of Gibraltar. Brig rigged for and schooner rigged at. He'd carry from 90 to 120 tons and had seen service on all of the seven seas. The Jane was weighing anchor at Gibraltar. <laughs> on her way to Brazil, her captain was Thomas Johnson, her cabin boy, a youth from Malta named Andrew Camelier. And in the captain's cabin, Ten pipes of sweet oil, 120 barrels of beeswax, 14 round jars of fine oil. Boy. Yes, Captain? How old are you, boy? Sixteen, sir. You understand the promise I made to your father, boy, that I would return you a man? Yes, sir. Continue with the manifest, boy. 300 oblong jars of olives, 14 boxes of raisins, 19 bolts of silk. Boy. Yes, sir. Your father said you were meek, too long, milk fat, and soft. We'll harden you, boy. Put leather where now there's down on your cheek. Shall I go on with Boy. The... Yes, sir? Soften that blonde hair of yours with sea spray and muscle those thin arms. Uh... Boy. Yes, sir? What have you got in your hand? Your watch, sir? I know it's my watch. And I know it was right here on my desk a minute ago. Well, I fidget, sir. So your father told me. Put the watch down. Yes, sir. My father also gave me a book called Tales of the Ocean. Never mind Sea. that. Go on with the manifest. Well, that's all except the dollars, sir. Read the manifest, boy. Six 18-gallon casks and one of about nine and one of about seven gallons. All filled with Spanish dollars to the number of 38,000. All the above to be delivered to Jose Miguel de Faria, Bahia, Brazil. You watch your P's and Q's, boy. Stop fidgeting! Yes, sir. After which, Andrew never tried to steal the captain's watch again. Instead... Captain, I saw Seaman Smith opening a cask in the hold and dipping into the olives. The youth quickly developed a sense of loyalty to his captain and the ship and its cargo. And the captain sensed it. Good boy. And did his best to instill the youth with a sense of responsibility. And the next day... You may flog Seaman Smith, boy. Here, take a whip. 
Now, don't flinch. Good boy. And nearly skinned Seaman Smith alive. A youth two weeks at sea and manhood busting through all over. Yet with a streak of gentleness. Mate. Mate Hyman. Yeah. I came down here to cruise quarters to see how Seaman Smith feels. I've seen whipping before, lad, but I got to hand it to you. You are a scientific whipper, you are. And that the truth, Frenchie? Oui. Yeah. Old Frenchie's seen whipping, too. Uh, oui. <laughs> You're a one, you know, that lad. Rumply blonde hair boy like you with cheddar face and a whipper like you. I didn't want to do it. Captain ordered me. I'm so sorry, Mr. Smith. Can't hear you, laddie. Well, tell him how sorry I am. I had to flog him unconscious. There's a question I'd like to be asking you, lad. Yes, sir? Because the crew's all asking it. How did the captain know in the first place that Smitty there was thieving? You tell, captain, little pink cheeks. Please. Please what? Leave me alone. Snitcher, ain't you? You leave me alone, or oh, what? You see this knife, don't you? You see this knife, don't you? Please leave me alone. Uh, look at him, Frenchy. Look at him with the knife. Oui. Funny, ain't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you what, laddie. Playing with knives, you'll be, eh? Well, now I'll be playing, too. A sticking game. You'll be all over the deck in a second. Please. That's your lady. <laughs> please, please let me alone. Now, look, look, laddie. Take that knife away from my throat. And then? Then will you let me alone? Oh, well, you were just gaming, laddie. You are a good gamer, you are. Put the knife away from my throat, laddie. Yeah. That's the laddie. Yes, sir. He's a one, ain't he, Frenchy? Yeah, we. Oui. Please, let's be friendly. Oh, we're shipmates, we are. My father told me to make friends. Shipmates, we are. We. Oui. The captain doesn't like me. Don't he now? And you such a gamer and a nazi. He thinks I want to break into the hold and steal all those Spanish dollars and dust. Just because I know where the keys are. Do you now? 38,000 in Spanish dollars. Them's the best kind. That's what's in those casks, eh? Oh, yes, sir. I could use some of those dollars, couldn't you, Frenchie? Yeah, we... Oui. Now, don't you tell the captain I told you about... All those dollars? Oh, no. We're shipmates. I'm glad I've made friends. Yes, oh, you have. But Mr. Patterson doesn't like me either. He's with the captain all the time and takes watch over him when he sleeps and... Mr. Patterson don't know true quality in a lad. Mr. Patterson's outside the captain's cabin right now. On such a black night. He hates me. Are we your friends? Come along, Frenchie. Mr. Patterson for you. Sleeping under the stars from a belaying pin. If he awakens, he'll raise an awful row. Oh, you know where that key is to the dollars, lad? Yes, but if Mr. Patterson wakes up... Frenchy. Oui? Throw Mr. Patterson overboard. Oui? Wait. I read in the book it was called Tales of the Ocean Sea. How bad pirates used to tie iron to the legs of victims. Oh. So they wouldn't float. So I bought a piece of iron along. Here it is. Frenchy, lash the iron to Mr. Patterson's leg so he won't float. We. Oui. Let's see the captain now, lad. Yes, sir. Captain's a very sound sleeper. Here's his gun. Be careful how you point. <laughs> Captain, right between the eyes. That's what you did, lad. Right between the eyes, I tell you. Deader than a pickled mackerel from Cooper's Coast, he is. <laughs> oh, lad, I know how you feel, lad. Accident, weren't it, lad? Yeah. You go on and weep, lad. It'll do you good. <laughs> Then.
That night, Andrew cried his heart out. So forlorn was he for having shot his father's friend and his captain that he did not venture above deck. And that's where all the activity was. Here, tar this piece of iron to the captain's leg, Frenchy. Oui. And using a ship shank knot and a 25-pound weight, they prepared the captain for sinking. Sank him. These few hours' activity was known as piracy. There was also murder. Altogether, a night of perfidy, sprung as it did from the innocence of a 16-year-old boy's suggestions. Just because the youth has read a long-since-banned book, Tales of the Ocean Sea, just because his father had gotten him a berth aboard ship, just because his father wanted to make a man of him. But Andrew still had a long way to go. Boy, boy. Never knew a soul could ache one like this. But it can. We. Where's the key to the dollars, boy? There. Beneath the captain's pillow. Hmm. Frenchy. We. Now we'll fetch. Wait. Yes, lad. What did you do with the captain? As we did with Mr. Patterson. Now there are eight of us. But Smitty cannot work. No, not since the flogging you give in. And have you noticed that Mr. Strawn is feeble and recovers poorly from his drinking? It's true. What are you saying, lad? Nothing. Frenchy? We? Oui. There are eight of us now, but two of us ain't very useful. Ain't no sense having them around to divide those dollars with. Frenchy? We. Oui. What Mr. Hyman and Frenchy did was unlock that section of the hold where the dollars were kept, remove the casks, and insert two of their shipmates, Mr. Smith and Mr. Strawn. It was then that the lad Andrew appeared on deck. What are you going to do with those tar pots, Mr. Hyman? Fire them and lead the smoke into the hold where Smitty and Strawn are? Why, then they'd suffocate... Frenchy? We... Listening to Crime Classics and your host, Thomas Hyland. Hear Marlena Dietrich as Diane LaVolta in a new adventure in colorful Spain. The sultry voiced Chanteuse helps a great bullfighter out of his difficulties in a story titled The Man Who Wanted to Die. Remember, tomorrow and every Thursday night on most of these same stations, the star's address brings you Marlena Dietrich in Time for Love. And now, once again, Thomas Hyland and the second act of Crime Classics. And his report to you on the good ship Jane, why she became flotsam. Some words about piracy. Next to being a sailor, being a pirate is man's oldest profession since he took to the sea. There is literature concerning this type of criminality all the way back to the Phoenicians. The Vikings were great pirates, and you'll be interested to know that during the Roman Civil Wars, the city itself was all but starved to death by the incursion of the old Etruscan pirates. Now, many of you undoubtedly think that piracy is a matter of the crew of one ship plundering another. Not so. As far back as the plunder of the Barkentine Athena in 1702, the Admiralty ruled that a crew which mutinies and murders its captain, and plunders its cargo, and steers the vessel off course, perhaps toward a different continent, a crew which does these things is lumped under the heading of pirates. Therefore, the crew of the schooner Jane of Gibraltar were pirates. Of this, there can be no doubt. 
And I say, let's take her to Africa, mates. Hey, Africa! 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 In Africa it is. Helmsman, change your course. South by southeast. Africa it is, lads, with Spanish dollars to fling and Spanish dollars to spend. Lad, Andrew. Yes, Captain? You're nearly done, lad. Aye, Captain. Each of us, now that we are six, will receive $6,300. Ah, you hear that, lads? 6,300 Spanish dollars for each of us. Oh, Morocco, Tangiers, Cairo. Captain. Oh, you like Africa, you bonny lad. Oh, the sights I can show you. And you, the curly-headed blondie lad you are, you'll have the ladies nippier than Thurston's kitty. Captain. Yes, lad. The African seas are filled with pirates. What are you saying, lad? I've heard. Corsairs from Tripoli and Turks and Saracens and... and... what? I'm frightened. Well, then be frightened, lad. What do you expect us to turn tail about and go to England, maybe, or... Scotland. Scotland? With their lonely shores and their long, lonely beaches, we could get ashore and nobody would know what. Ah, uh, wouldn't be any pirates, either. Oh, no. <laughs> Scotland. Bonnie Scotland. Oh, yes. Yeah. Scotland it is. Helmsman, change your course. Northern or west. And they sailed in that direction for 17 days. It was a singularly uneventful voyage. In passing other ships, they hoisted the American colors, identified themselves as the Rover, 30 days from New York, bound for Archangel. And Hyman went about clothed in the captain's green greatcoat. The boy Andrew stayed below most of the trip, reading. But one day, when Hyman brought him his breakfast, the boy looked up from his book and he said, When are you going to give orders to scuttle the ship, Captain? Scuttle it, lad. Else there'll be surely someone in Scotland who'll recognize the ship as a Jane and ask of the captain. And... Uh, scuttle it, I say. Off the Cape of Stornoway. Off the Cape of Stornoway. And two nights later, within sight of the Scottish coast at Stornoway, you remember, Hyman began to drill holes in the bottom of the boat. Uh, here's an axe. Sir. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Sir, what is it, you bonny lad? I think you should give orders to man the longboat. Backs into it, men. Yo, what's the matter with you, Dora? Tide against us. We never make it sure. Oh, Paul, I tell you. Uh, oh, there she go. There she go. What? Uh, the, oh, I, I lost me my heart. Catch! Catch she go! Ah, you stupid lump thumb. Dumb of them Prescott symbol. <laughs> yeah, now, lad. Never. Oh, never. Ah, what are you saying, lad? You never get the car. I'll drown in our chest of money. We'll lie at the bottom of the sea. Oh, now, lad. The things you forced me to do, the terrible things. Lad, lad. The awful things. <laughs> Now hear this. Now hear this. What the sea did. It sent a huge and wonderful wave to the scene. And this huge and wonderful wave did this. Lifted high the longboat, the dollars and the sailors. And on a narrow strand of beach, put them down again. This huge and wonderful wave. Phew. Blimey. <laughs> Ain't this something, Frenchy? Oh, we. Oui. Wave tossing us, boat and all right to shore. <laughs> Led, Andrew Led. Yes? We're saved. Yes. Yes, we're saved. We're saved. Give a cheer, lads. We're saved. <laughs> and, and it's this bonny, bonny lad that's the cause of it all. This lad, this Andrew. This curly, blondling Andrew lad. Oh, lad. It is a great and good luck thing to know you. To sail with your likes. Thank you. Thank you, he says. Hey, hey such a lad. Such a lad you are. <laughs> But the rest of that night was a terrible one. 
the fury of the skies and the sea over that narrow strand, and six men huddled there, not daring to move, lest they lose their way in the dark and stumble into the torrent. Yet, even in these small hours of despair, they had presence of mind enough to bury, each of them, part of their Spanish dollars. And we should take an oath of secrecy. And they, each of them, took a terrible oath, swore never to reveal what had happened, nor of the money, nor the murders. A good thing, too, for the next day, a suddenly becalmed and sunny day, Ahoy! Ahoy there! a group of men came running up the beach toward them. Ahoy there! Hello! What do you hear? A boat broke up in the sea, and praise be for a sturdy longboat. Who be you? Roderick McIver. Ah. We be off the old fated catch, the Betsy out of San Francisco. I am McIver, surveyor of customs. These are my men. Oh? And we'll want to look at your sea chest. Oh. You, Colonel, open me that sea chest, for instance, and I'll have a look. Now yeah, we'll see. Yeah, what's this? Dollars now. Huh. Spanish dollars. <laughs> now you. Please, sir. How come a blundering boy like you is so scurvy lookers, eh? Yes, sir. Colonel, stand guard here while I fetch a brace of constables to this spot. This has the looks of I don't know what. But I didn't like it. Please, sir. Eh. How old be you, boy? Sixteen, sir. There's never been a razor to my cheek. Hell, yeah. If I could see my father. Sir. Yes, lad? Could I walk with you? <laughs> Fairly hated boy could be my own son, almost. <laughs> Surely, walk with me. I have something to tell you, sir. Well, of what happened? Oh, sir. Oh, sir. Lad, lad, what? They held me prisoner out of Malta and, and murdered Captain and Mr. Patterson and nice Mr. Smith and Mr. Strawn. They suffocated the nice Mr. Smith and Strawn with smoke from a tar barrel and stole those Spanish dollars. Are you saying the truth? I'll take an oath on it. And you'll so testify, lad? I want to. Go on, lad. Or continue with your story. And I struggled with Mr. Hyman with the pistol, and he overcame me and killed Captain. And, and then? I had that one who we call Frenchy tie iron to Captain's leg and throw him overboard. And, and then? Suffocated two others with smoke from a tar barrel. How old are you, lad? Sixteen. My father's far away in Malta. I must tell you, boy, as a father myself and as judge in the court of law, that ne'er have a witness such a courageous lad as you. You are as candid a witness as e'er appeared before me. Your manners are modest, and your statements are sincere and distinct. And it is to your due that justice is trying the case of these men, Peter Hyman and the Frenchman Francois Gautier. You may step down, boy. Peter Hyman and Francois Gautier. The rest of your crew has been dismissed as not guilty of the heinous crimes as charged. But the jury has found the two of you to be beasts of the sea and guilty as charged. Therefore, I announce to you the sentence of death, which will be forthwith put into execution. Though your crimes as charged be murder and piracy, to my mind your guilt is of a far greater kind. The scar is slashed across innocence. The innocence of that youth sitting there. Gentle child of blundling curl, bravely hiding the scalding hurt. Vipers. And upon the second Wednesday of January next to come, you will be dead. I have here an account of the execution. The two men, Peter Hyman and Francois Gautier ascended the drop at 20 minutes past 11. They remained on the platform for some minutes, 
being administered as they were by men of the cloth. But observers noted that neither one seemed to listen to prayers, nor did they repeat any supplications. Rather, did they merely stand there and shake their heads as if, some observers say, they did not believe what was happening to them. In the pressing crowd of onlookers was seen Master Andrew Camelier, close to the front, smiling and bowing to those who recognized him. Andrew Camelier, I should tell you, never went back to Malta, nor to sea. He was married next year to the comely daughter of a widower, and when his father-in-law shot himself to death in six months' time, he inherited a large sum of money. In just a moment, Thomas Highland will tell you about next week's crime classic. The Good Ship Jane, tonight's crime classic, was adapted from the original court reports and newspaper accounts by Morton Fine and David Friedkin. The music was composed and conducted by Bernard Herman, and the program is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. Thomas Highland is portrayed on radio by Lou Merrill. In tonight's story, Gary Montgomery was heard as Andrew and Van Wright as Hyman. Featured in the cast were Herb Butterfield, Paul Fries, Steve Roberts, and William Johnstone. Bob Lamont speaking. Now, here again is Thomas Highland. Next week, Suffolk, England, in the year 1676. We will concern ourselves at that time with a rousing croquet match, a fine old castle at stake. Winner take all. It's listed in my files as Roger Nems, how he, though dead won the game. Thank you. Good night. This coming Sunday, CBS Radio's Department of Public Affairs offers a documented progress report on the Negro in America, titled The High Mountain. Narrators will be William H. Hasty, United States Court of Appeals judge, and Admiral Alan G. Kirk. The same production team that brought you Bomb Target USA, 38th Parallel, USA Parole File 732, and other hard-hitting factual documents about life in America, now turns its attention on the high mountain for a look at the progress and problems of the Negro in America. This Sunday, on most of these same stations. You hear America's favorite shows on the CBS Radio Network.